Hello. It's an absolutist fact that the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. Like, the further you spread away uh, power lines and alternating current, the more magnetism you can store. If you actually fundamentally also understand the conjugate nature of the universe, you'll realize that everything is force in motion and inertia and acceleration. There is no exception to this. And the conjugate geometry of the universe is toroidal for force in motion, i.e. centrifugal divergence. And this is what we think of when we talk about the magnetic field that actually surrounds a magnet, but people actually don't know what a magnet is. I mean, a magnet is quantitatively no different before it becomes a magnet than after it becomes a magnet. So what is the qualitative nature of the magnet? And that, of course, is the fact that it's point source. Here we actually have uh, the plane of inertia along these two magnets. Let's say this one, and this is a perfect, I'm going to go into black holes here very shortly, but I'm going to give you a perfect analogy that I think should actually illustrate it in your mind. This is an N40 Gauss magnet, and this would be a N55 Gauss or N60 Gauss uh, neodymium ion boron or samarium cobalt. It doesn't really make any difference. And when uh, people buy these, most of them are N35 or N40 Gauss um, people will uh, make note of the actual uh, spatial nature, i.e. the voluminous nature of the magnetic field that surrounds, say, the N35 or N40 Gauss. And, of course, this is what fascinates people about magnets, is the field. And, of course, the field is toroidal or donut shape. And this, of course, is mass. This is not specifically mass and what we think about it as far as weight or something of that, but we're talking about the actual voluminous nature of the field, how far out it extends, as so far as the field geometry relational to, for example, this uh, N40 Gauss magnet. Here we have a North Pole, here we have the South Pole. We're not talking about pole orientation. Of course, a magnet doesn't actually have poles, then we have to get into defining a force vector, and the incommensurability of point source. And of course, the toroidal geometry that surrounds any magnet is, of course, the force in motion vector of the field that defines magnetism, and magnetism is the dielectric field. Literally, it is the flip side of the coin, if you will, of the silver of the conjugate geometry of the universe, which is force and motion, nurse and acceleration. Obviously, magnetism defines force and motion. And here we have right here the hyperboloid, or an hourglass shape. We could actually kind of draw the hourglass shape here. This is the geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration. Once again, let's remind ourselves that we're looking at an N40 Gauss or N35 Gauss magnet. And of course, the voluminous nature of the magnetism is the only thing people are interested in. Like if I get a nail this close to the magnetic field of this magnet, it will start to accelerate. People think that's magnetic attraction, but that's ridiculous. Anything that actually accelerates towards the point source nature of this unique phenomena that people are so amazed by has nothing to do with magnetism. That's literally dielectric acceleration. And that, of course, is not a force. There's no such thing as magnetic attraction. It's completely ridiculous. Magnetism, by de definition, both uh, denotatively and connotatively, and the correct understanding of the conjugate geometry of the universe, is that magnetism is force in motion. If you wanted to define true magnetism, that would be what we would call quote-unquote magnetic repulsion. But let's not uh, diverge uh, too far off topic here. Now let's go over to the N55 or N60 gals. People say, well, I'm really fascinated by magnets. And I'm going to buy me an expensive magnet, N55 Gauss. The N40 is really cool, but uh, the N55 is definitely going to be a lot better. And I get emails about this uh, quite often, uh, believe it or not. And people will think, well, people don't understand what a magnet is or what defines a magnet. And uh, they uh, think the magnetism is something wholly separate and unique. You know, that a magnet is, quote-unquote, emitting magnetism and it's it's not it's not emitting magnetism it's uh the actual nature of uh, the ether the field that actually surrounds um the magnet the magnet is not emitting anything actually quantum uh, idiots actually will say that a magnet is emitting quote unquote virtual photons or virtual particles which is completely ridiculous this is an arbitrary concept uh, completely dreamt of in the minds of uh, intellectually drunk people they're not the inputs or outputs of any experiment ever done it's completely ludicrous but let's actually get onto the topic of this really really strong really really powerful magnet and that people will realize relative to once they purchase it and they'll say by their cylinder or bar magnet similar to that other in 35 gauss magnet which has this sort of magnetic field around it and i'm kind of drawing this improperly here because i only have so much space to draw that you know what is the issue with the fact 
that the spatial bubble, if you will, the toroidal bubble that surrounds the super powerful magnet is much smaller. In other words, you have to get a nail, for example, or other ferromagnetic objects much closer to the physical magnet of the more powerful magnet. Well, this doesn't make sense. I mean, from their understanding, which is, you know, humanity is completely unevolved when it comes to understanding field theory, you have to get uh, a ferromagnetic object a lot closer to the more powerful magnet. Well, that should not be the case. The more powerful magnet should have a larger field than, say, our uh, N40 or N35 Gauss uh, over here magnet, but uh, just the opposite is the case because people don't realize that magnetism is the dielectric field. When you actually increase the power of the magnet, people need to understand that power a la a magnet, when we're talking about N55 Gauss or N50 Gauss, or there's even some uh, they don't hold very well, but they're in 60 gauss. Uh, some of these, uh, that, that magnetism is the dielectric field. When you actually increase the power of the magnet, what you're also doing proportionally, since we're talking about the conjugate geometry of the universe and the magnet is not powerful enough to vanish from this universe, what happens is, is that you greatly increase the dielectric acceleration of the nature, because you can't have one without the other. Whatever happens to one happens to the other. By increasing the power of the magnet, what you've done, and power is only proportional to the dielectric. Remember, the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. In other words, a high capacity or a dangerous capacitor, for example, is very small spatially. The same is true, and I'm trying to use this capacitor analogy, which is a reality, the smaller space, higher the capacitance, in re re uh, in relationship to discussing or painting a, a visual picture in your brain about the fact that a more powerful magnet has a much smaller spatially voluminous toroidal uh, field around it, a la the ether, than does a less powerful magnet. Well, a more powerful magnet should have a bigger field. No, the power of the magnet is in the dielectric. Everything is the dielectric in any object. Magnetism is the loss of that energy, of that ether, of that inertia. The more you increase it, and this, of course, does not uh, work in uh, in the real world, but real world, but say, for example, you are standing in your shower and you increase the power output uh, from the head of your shower and taking a shower, and uh, proportional to that, uh, of course, your drain only drains via gravity. It does not suck in the water at the bottom of your bathtub. But say, for example, you had a tub that uh, worked in conjunction with the output. By actually increasing the power output, you drastically increase the, the suction at which the water drains at that bottom of the drain. The same is true analogously uh, with uh, the magnet. Uh, this more powerful magnet actually has a smaller magnetic toroidal field around it. Now, let's actually talk about the uh, black hole. The only reason why all these idiot scientists and relativists and quantum uh, mechanic uh, nut jobs have been uh, arguing about a black hole is that its uh, inherent contradiction only stems from the fact that we have no analog here on Earth. People are confused when we talk about mass. So we're not talking about weight. However, weight is uh, uh, often interchanged uh, equally with that of mass. We think as mass is weight and weight is mass. But uh, what if a magnitude was non -existent? Let's take, for example, uh, a single weight. Let's say a one-pound uh, lead weight. And remember, the most important thing that we have to understand is that the only reason anything has volume um, in the universe is due to magnetism and magnetism only. The one thing accurately you learned in school or high school or college is that every atom, and this is what they said, every atom is 99 point, you know, 9999999, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, percent, they say empty space. In other words, this is an atom, right? It's basically, there's nothing here. Well, that's not true. The air inside the balloon or the, uh, the radius in picometers of every atom is uh, due to magnetodielectricity. In other words, every atom obviously is a dynamo and it's actually generating magnetodielectricity and the volume, if you will, of every atom, this is our little tiny nucleus in here, infinitely smaller than that, um, is uh, right here. But the only reason this atom has any volume is due to magnetodielectricity and the volume of which is the magnetism. Okay, now let's actually apply that to something that's supermassive that actually attains to point source coherence. We know that actually stars die when they start uh, creating iron, and of course uh, iron is a magical, uh, if you will, because it 
can. Well, actually, we're not drawing that. Let's actually draw a super mass here. And let's erase that. And uh, normal super mass. Okay, where we actually have pressure equalization. This is the force in motion vector that keeps anything within the visible universe. And this, of course, is magnitude, yes? Magnitude of what something takes up in our space relative to its radius, its circumference, its diameter. And that is solely due to magnetism and magnetism only. The only thing that keeps anything, I'm repeating myself, but it's so important, the only thing that keeps anything in our visible universe is magnetism and magnetism only. And of course we have against that, and this is the reason why too, when you melt bismuth, bismuth is the universe's most uh, uh, diamagnetic uh, element, i.e. hates magnetism, if you will. This is what happens when you melt bismuth that actually shrinks substantially. I've melted a lot of bismuth. This is the dielectric inertia and acceleration, which is fighting um, magnetism's uh, force and motion vector to keep a specific magnitude. Like a pound of bismuth has a certain uh, magnitude that is wholly different than a pound of styrofoam, right? Versus a pound of lead, versus a pound of uh, titanium. Um, and of course, this has to do with the magnetic and dielectric properties uh, operating against one another, and they operate in a certain balance, and some of this balance is extremely bizarre. Like I said, when you melt bismuth, it shrinks drastically. And the reason why it shrinks drastically is because bismuth is the most diamagnetic element in the universe. That is also the reason why it is the most diamagnetic element. Uh, excuse me, it's the most diamagnetic element, therefore when it actually uh, heats, you actually bring it to a state of uh, that it uh, will uh, seek uh, pressure equalization relative to its uh, electrical, magnetic, and dielectric properties, it will actually uh, attain to or, or rest itself in a very small volume. Here, of course, we have pressure equalization. We, depending on the elements and depending on the mass, we uh, have uh, a supermass, whether that be a star or a pound of lead or a pound of anything that actually has a certain mass, a certain volume within the universe, but... And we have no analog for this in our world, but it is hyperlogical, and if you think about it, you will understand that it is hyperlogical. If, however, like I said, once again, I'm repeating myself, the only reason why anything has any um, mass in the universe is due to magnetism, but if we actually have a supermass that attains to point source, okay, we're drawing out the magnetic uh, vectors here that keep something within the universe, but... Okay, this is the fight between uh, spatial and counterspatial. This is, of course, now we actually have the fight towards counterspace right here. And, of course, this is spatial over here. Everything out here is spatial. This is, of course, the magnitude that keeps anything in the visible universe. And here we actually have uh, the counteraction of counterspace, the dielectric nature of an element or of a mass. But if that supermass attains to point source then we actually have something interesting that happens, and that is, is that, let's erase all these magnetic vectors here. The only thing that we're left with, we're left with extreme disproportionality, such that we have extreme disproportion, disproportionality between the spatial vectors and counterspatial vectors of the dielectric and the magnetic, just like our capacitor, just like our... Uh, normal magnet versus our super powerful magnet. And then what we have, interestingly enough, I'm going to draw this here. Let's get rid of the spatial here. We still have this volume here. Okay. We still have this volume or magnitude here. But the mass vanishes from our visible universe. And then what we're left with, there we go. Of course, it's not a point, but let's uh, draw this out here. There we go. What we're left with is this magnitude where no mass is, and we actually have this enormous, enormous counterspatial vector where something literally vanishes from the visible universe. So we actually have something, we have a large magnitude with no mass or volume at all. Uh, a black hole is not black. And it's certainly not a whole, but what it is is where a counterspatial vector of the dielectric has completely overthrown magnetism's ability to keep an enormous mass within the visible universe. So we actually have something that 
has enormous magnitude but absolutely no mass and no footprint within the visible universe. But this is superficially contradictory only to our uh, experiences here and our uh, limited senses and experiences on this world since we have no analog on this earth for that. But we have all of this where magnetism formerly kept an enormous mass within the universe and it is completely, completely gone. So now we actually have a super magnitude with no mass. We just, what we have is this. You want to call that a black hole if you want. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's not whole and it's not black, but we have an enormous magnitude with what's here. This is dielectricity completely overthrowing magnetism. The only reason why anything would actually exist in the visible universe is solely due to magnetism, force and motion vector. But those force and motion vectors have been completely overthrown. A black hole is not obtuse or absurd or science fiction or illogical. It's only these idiot scientists debating about uh, the seemingly contradictory nature of a black hole, but it's not contradictory at all. If you actually understand the conjugate nature of the universe, it's hyperlogical. You have something where dielectricity has literally overthrown that enormous entity's ability to maintain a footprint within the visible universe because the visible universe is dominated 110% by magnetism. The only reason anything has a foothold for volume, for uh, mass in the universe is magnetism. The only reason. And this is also the reason why really powerful magnets have small magnetic footprints, if you will. It's like, well, this magnet is really powerful. I must have been, you know, screwed over. I must have been, uh, you know, swindled. This person's selling me a weak magnet. It's like, no, you've actually got a really powerful magnet. But what you don't understand, a more powerful magnet has a much stronger dielectric field. And that is why the spatial footprint of the magnetic field in volume surrounding that super powerful magnet is so small. And people just cannot make the connection. They think a magnet is magnetism. You know, you get a, a, a super powerful magnet. By God, that sucker better have a huge magnetic field because that is exactly the way it should be, right? more magnetism it has or the more powerful the magnet, the bigger the magnetic footprint it should have. And that is absolutely not the case. The more powerful that magnet is, the smaller the spatial footprint of the magnetic field is because all you have done on the more powerful magnet is greatly increase the dielectric field of inertia and acceleration towards counter space, i.e. the plane of inertia right here. Okay, This is the conjugate geometry of the universe, the toroid and uh, the hyperboloid, respectively the torus and the hourglass shape. This is the conjugate geometry, the yin and the yang, the tower of the universe, right here. And the more you increase the power, the more you decrease the magnetic field. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I hope that explained a few things. Okay? Thank you.